In the pre-dawn hours, a house catches fire in Wisconsin. Investigators determine that the blaze is a smokescreen designed to hide a more horrific act of violence. But the heat of the flames leaves the crime trail cold. In southern Florida, a series of fires becomes more than a coincidence. People are dying, and a community is frightened. Detectives must work quickly to calm fears and catch the killer before he strikes again. At a crime scene, everything is considered a potential clue. But a fire can destroy everything in its path. Challenging forensic investigators at every turn and making each arson a trial by fire. In this episode, some of the names have been changed. Two thirty in the morning, November twenty fifth, nineteen ninety six. Most of La Crosse, Wisconsin, slept, but one of its residents woke up to an alarming sight. The neighbor's house is on fire. What's the address, sir, please? He noticed smoke pouring from his neighbor's house. Fire trucks raced to the scene, arriving moments later to find it consumed by flames. If anyone was home, firefighters feared they were trapped inside. La Crosse firefighter Dan Skiles knew he and his men had to get in quickly if they hoped to get anyone out alive. But there appeared to be no way in. So instead of my normal routine of putting my shoulder into that door and pushing it open, I decided to sit down and use my legs to kick the door open. Firefighter Skiles kicked open the door and discovered the floor of the kitchen completely destroyed by the fire. With no path to guide them, they relied on each other, making their way through the flames and looking for anyone who was trapped inside. The person on the nozzle yelled out that he had a victim. We picked him up. I dragged him as far as I could before I ran out of air. Despite their best efforts, firefighters pulled a man's lifeless body out of the burning rubble. It was the homeowner, 64-year-old Donald Harmasek. And firefighter Dan Skiles suspected something else was wrong. There was blood on his head, and I thought that that was unusual for a victim in a house fire to have any type of blood on him. It was at that moment firefighters suspected they were dealing with something more than an accident. The body was transported to the morgue for autopsy. La Crosse, Wisconsin detectives Dave Schatzley and Kerry Jaholski interviewed the neighbor who phoned police. And although he saw the flames, he said he did not see or hear anything out of the ordinary. Once the fire department declared the house safe for entry, fire investigators went to work. Deputy Fire Marshal Gene Brink began the preliminary investigation to determine the fire's point of origin. A fire investigator in determining the cause of the fire starts in the area of least damage, the outside of the house or the living room where there was no fire, and works back to the area of most damage. The house was cluttered with books and magazines. Detectives opened them and found money hidden inside. but the victim's wallet was found empty on the table. As firefighters packed up, 
Fire Marshal Brink went down to the basement and inspected the debris, looking for some explanation for the blaze. I want to show you why I think I'm convinced we had a set fire here. In our investigation, we determined that the fire had started in the basement. That's where the greatest burn had occurred. We found one area under the kitchen where the fire had burned on top of a pile of magazines. There was no heat producing device in the area. We had a set fire at that one particular place. This was an arson. Lacrosse arson investigators checked the outside perimeter of the house. They needed to find out who started the fire and why. They noticed a broken basement window. Investigators believed whoever started the fire may have entered through that window. In the snow, one of them discovered an undisturbed shoe print leading away from the house. Since it was dark, he covered the print with a metal trash can in order to preserve this possible clue. The autopsy was performed at the Veterans Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. The medical examiner found deep circular wounds in the victim's skull. The force of the blows caused severe hemorrhaging and trauma, rendering him unconscious and unable to escape the fire. Now, along with arson, authorities believed they were also investigating a murder. Hey, everybody, we want to get a briefing in and get some job assignments. Early the, the next morning here. at the La Crosse right. Police Department, right. investigators right. compared the information they gathered so far. Detective Joe Dunham was one of the lead investigators on the case. The uh, coroner thought it was a gun shot, but then he determined later it was a blunt instrument to the head that killed Mr. Armachek. Uh, there's a footprint on the east side of the house in the snow. Detectives also needed to follow up on the most promising clue so far, the footprint left in the back of the house. At the crime scene, technicians arrived to make a cast of the frozen shoe print. The snow's hardened crystalline structure captured the most intricate detail, but it had to be handled carefully so as not to destroy the print. Before a cast was attempted, the shoe print was photographed, just in case. Hot sulfur, which solidifies on contact with the cold snow, was used as the casting medium. The sulfur hardens almost instantly, ensuring the snow does not melt before the cast is created. It recorded every groove and pattern of the shoe print. The newly formed cast was sent to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. Inside the house, blood spatter stained the furniture and the surrounding floor. Forensic scientist Nick Stalke reconstructed the fatal scenario. The stains that were on the front of this chest of drawers were two to six millimeters in size. Those are indicative of a uh, stains that you would see at a, a beating or, or a stabbing. He stretched pieces of string back from the blood spatter to determine the position of the victim at the moment of the attack. By the point of convergence of the blood stains, I was able to determine that Mr. Harmasek was beaten just in front of this chest of drawers. We did find a hammer that was in the area of these blood stains. The chest of drawers and the hammer were sent to the crime lab for analysis. A lacrosse police officer spoke with Shirley Otto, the victim's longtime companion. So right now you can't think of anybody that would want to do any harm to him? She and Donald Harmasek had been together for over 20 years. She told the officer they had a good relationship, that Donald was well-liked, and everyone called him by his nickname, Pops. Shirley also told the officer that Donald had been upset recently because his house had been repeatedly burglarized. I think you get most of it there because in trust 
La Crosse police detectives Joe Dunham and Brad Berkey looked into police reports and arrest records involving burglaries of the Harmasic residents. They found no shortage of names. It appeared perpetrators considered Donald Harmasic an easy mark. He was someone that we knew kept money in his residence, and he had been targeted in the past by various burglars. Police went to question a known local petty thief named Adam Tallbridge. But when he heard the police, he ran. Tallbridge looked like a promising suspect. Back at the station, he denied any involvement with the Harmasic homicide. Tallbridge claimed he panicked when he heard the police. That is why he ran. He agreed to cooperate and allowed his tennis shoes to be tested. They were sent out for analysis to the state crime lab, where forensic scientist Jerry Cota Jarvie was analyzing the footprint casts from the crime scene. There are a lot of shoes that have the same size and tread design, but it's the unique characteristics that identifies that shoe to that impression. They're like cuts and uh, uh, missing pieces and wear and so on. He determined that the footwear worn at the scene was an Airwalk tennis shoe, the same type worn by Tallbridge. But when he compared the casts to the sneakers, he found the shoes were the wrong size. Adam Tallbridge was not their man. Then, Cota Jarvie discovered something unusual. There were actually two separate and distinct shoe prints, one on top of the other. He concluded they were now looking for two suspects, not one. Detective Berkey realized they had to rethink their investigation. Detective and Donald and I both believed that there might be more to this. I mean, that information I mean, pointed us in the right direction. Investigators still had no idea who killed Donald Harmasek, and they faced an even greater challenge. They were now looking for two suspects and their hope was that the newly discovered shoe prints would lead them straight to the killers. 64-year-old Donald Harmasek was murdered and his house set on fire to cover up the crime. Investigators discovered they were now searching for two suspects, but so far the crime scene yielded a limited number of clues and detectives Brad Berkey and Joe Dunham were frustrated. When you burn a body, you take a lot of evidence with it. And also, when you burn the home, there you take a lot of evidence there. It was a challenge. We had a big challenge ahead of us because we had no suspects in this brutal murder. At the crime lab, forensic scientists continued their investigation. Nick Stalkey studied the victim's blood-spattered cabinet. Soot marks and spatter indicated that one of the drawers was partially open at the time of the murder. The chest of drawers provided Nick Stalkey with important information. The individual was beaten in, just in front of this chest of drawers, and then the drawers were repositioned, and then the fire started. It told us then that not only did the individuals beat the victim, but they also then ransacked that house after he was down and bleeding, and then started the fire and left. Investigators now believe the perpetrator set the fire with the intent to cover up an even greater crime. At the Wisconsin State Crime Lab, forensic scientist Ken Olson tested debris from the burned house. He believed a flammable liquid was used to start the blaze. It's very difficult to just take 
materials that are present uh, to start a fire. But with an ignitable liquid, you can accelerate that fire and get it going faster. Liquid accelerants leave traces behind that slowly evaporate. The debris collected was placed inside a can along with a carbon strip. Carbon absorbs any traces of the accelerant left behind. The can is sealed and then heated to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I then take that paint can with the charcoal strip inside, place it into the oven. After heating for 16 hours, the carbon strip is then put into a gas chromatograph that analyzes the chemical components of the accelerant. I take that vial and put it on the instrument and uh, it's uh, automated, uh, injects the solvent into the instrument and I'm looking for any known accelerants that are there. Every chemical has a unique molecular fingerprint. The chromatograph reveals that molecular structure. I examined uh, the residues that I recovered and found uh, the residues of gasoline in uh, three of the samples that were collected from the scene. Investigators turned to the community and they set up a crime solver's tip line. The leads began to pour in. One of the callers claimed a man named Todd Carpenter knew something about the murder. Detectives brought Carpenter in for questioning. He began to spell out his involvement, telling investigators he was contacted by two men. He was approached by Nathan Lindell and Josh Lindell, and that he was a driver, and they were just going there for a burglary. According to Carpenter, the Lindell brothers heard a rumor that Donald Harmasek kept lots of cash in his house, and they wanted it. The brothers offered Carpenter money to drive the getaway car. Carpenter told the detectives he stayed with the car while Nathaniel and Josh Lindell committed the burglary. He waited outside while Josh and Nathan Lindell went inside the residence looking for money and rummaged around the basement and went upstairs looking for money. And at that time, they, were, they, they stumbled across Donald Harmacek. Afterwards, the brothers instructed him to drive to the top of Granddad Bluff, a secluded spot overlooking the city of La Crosse. There, they built a fire and burned the clothes they had been wearing, including their shoes. Carpenter was surprised when Nathaniel told him the man inside the house was, quote, toast by now. What is he doing? Tell him to come on, let's get out of here. The brothers paid Carpenter his money. In total, they had stolen $300 from Harmasek. Carpenter said he got nervous when he heard about the murder on the news the next day. Detectives ran the Lindell brothers' names through the computer. Josh Lindell's record was clean, but Nathaniel had a rap sheet riddled with prior arrests, including burglary. Okay, Marcus. Investigators began to believe Carpenter, but they had no concrete evidence to back up his story. In the hopes of getting some, detectives convinced him to wear a wire. Maybe they could catch Nathaniel incriminating himself. Carpenter went to see Nathaniel. He told him the police were asking a lot of questions. He said he was scared. He didn't know what to do or say. No, no, no. It's just been coming by my work, asking me all kinds of questions, you know, about who I was with and who I hate. Nathaniel played it cool. He indicated knowledge of the crime, but said nothing that could actually incriminate himself. He was telling him to stay cool and just, you know, don't tell him anything and and that uh, those SOBs, you know, they, they ain't gonna get nothing out of me. They were convinced Nathaniel Lindell was the mastermind, but the wired conversation was no proof. 
Since Carpenter couldn't help them anymore, detectives hoped Josh Lindell could. He did agree to speak with us, and that surprised me. His initial statement to us, he took the blame. Detectives finally got the break they needed. But the extreme violence of the crime and their strongest piece of evidence, the shoe prints, pointed to two killers. Detectives knew they needed more if they were to catch them both. La Crosse, Wisconsin detectives were deep in the middle of the arson murder investigation of 64-year-old Donald Harmasek. The footprints found in the snow led investigators to two suspects, the Lindell brothers. Detectives Joe Dunham and Brad Berkey had placed Josh Lindell in custody. Although he claimed he acted alone, the detectives knew differently. Detective Brad Berkey hoped Josh would give up his brother. I believed that he was involved, but I never expected him in the interview to tell us that he was the one that did this. I fully expected him to tell us that his brother was more involved than he was, and that surprised me. He was remorseful that he did this, felt bad about it. And he was trying to make some amends by telling us uh, what he did. Although Josh was taking the blame, in order to prove their case, detectives needed him to reveal his brother's involvement. Josh appeared nervous. He said he had never been in trouble with the law. And after hours of questioning, Josh Lindell finally admitted the whole story. He said he and Nathaniel broke in through the basement window, stepping on each other's footprints to obscure their tracks and to throw off police. So we're gonna look for those. They found Donald Harmasek asleep on the couch and panicked. I was scared, it scared me, and I, I panicked and I hit him over the head. Are you willing to speak with us in regard to this? He said his brother Nathan also repeatedly struck the victim in the head with a hammer and left him for dead. Then they set the house on fire to cover up their crime. Josh's story matched Todd Carpenter's. He said they drove up to the bluff so he and his brother could burn their clothes and destroy evidence. Murder was never part of the plan. Although by the time they left, the plan had fallen apart. After Josh's confession, investigators had what they needed to bring in Nathaniel for breaking and entering, arson, and the murder of Donald Harmasa. They arrested him at the apartment he shared with his roommate. And place you in the squad car after he searches you. When we get down to the police station, then we'll he was handcuffed and taken to the okay. police station, where he was booked. Detectives also came armed with a search warrant. They questioned Nathaniel's roommate and searched for evidence. Even though Josh said they burned the shoes they wore, investigators collected another pair at his apartment. At the state crime lab, the shoes confiscated from Nathaniel were determined to be airwalks, the same style and tread design of the shoe print cast. Although not an exact match, the wear pattern was uniquely similar to those worn at the crime scene. Despite the evidence against him and the fact that both Todd Carpenter and his own brother Josh incriminated him, Nathaniel Lindell refused to talk. He would not speak to us, that's his right, of course. But uh, Nathan is uh, cold-hearted, uh, would, would uh, do anything. Based on the evidence, police determined that Nathaniel and Josh Lindell broke into Donald Harmasek's home, intending to burglarize it. Josh was surprised to find the homeowner asleep on the sofa. Armasek began to stir. Josh panicked. Nathaniel then struck him with the hammer he'd used to break the basement window. 
beating him unconscious. On their way out, the brothers took the money from the victim's wallet. They set the house on fire to cover up the murder. They then carefully stepped in each other's footprints, hoping to fool the authorities. It didn't turn out that way. I believe Josh was uh, definitely part of the crime, but he was not the leader of the group. It was Nathan Lindell, his older brother, that was the leader. On February 3rd, 1998, Nathaniel Lindell was convicted of first-degree murder, burglary, and arson. He was sentenced to life in prison. He will be eligible for parole in 50 years. His brother, Josh Lindell, was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life. He will be eligible for parole in 25 years. In exchange for his testimony, Todd Carpenter was not charged. La Crosse homicide detectives narrowed in on one piece of forensic evidence, yielding two suspects who used arson to hide their crime. In Florida, authorities faced an ever-widening challenge as a string of similar fires became more than a coincidence. In the early morning of August 7, 1993, in Spring Hill, Florida, the Hernando County Fire Department responded to a burning residence. Firefighters raced to the home of 80-year-old Becky Saunders. When they arrived, the flames had already ravaged a large portion of the house. The extreme heat was overwhelming, and the entrances were blocked. But the firefighters did all they could to rescue the elderly resident and salvage her home. It took hours, but the firefighters finally got the fire under control. Forensic specialist Gary Kimball investigated. Due to the extensive nature of the fire, we ran into some problems. We were unable to examine a lot of the things that we would like to have examined because they just weren't there anymore. The heat was so intense, any potential evidence was destroyed. Investigators were unable to identify an immediate cause. Firefighters could not save Becky Saunders, an elderly widow who lived alone. She died at the scene. Police interviewed Becky Saunders' neighbor. He told investigators she didn't smoke, but she often fell asleep with the TV and lights on. He mentioned a possible electrical problem. The house had been struck by lightning a month or two earlier. Perhaps it had caused some damage that led to the fire. All the neighbors knew Becky and were eager to talk about her. They said she was in good health and quite independent. Fire investigators asked if anyone saw anything unusual. No one did. The Hernando County Sheriff's Arson Unit, led by Detective Mike Owens, searched for answers. When they could not determine the fire's immediate cause, they needed to consider another possibility, arson. Arson investigation is not an exact science. It's a big puzzle. You try to take charred remains and then put them back together. You, we take everything in the room out and try to reproduce the locations of the furniture, uh, everything and anything that was in there, and try and see where you're having low burns, high burns, to see what area the, the fire actually traveled. The debris collected from the house was sent to the lab for analysis. Arson expert Carl Chastain looked for pore patterns or the residue of a flammable chemical, an accelerant, that would indicate arson. What we're trying to determine is, has there been something added to this fire scene that would cause it to burn faster and hotter 
than it would if it were an accidental fire. That's what we're looking for. We're looking to see if there's been an accelerant added to the fire. The photographs reveal the progression of the fire, which started in the bedroom. Investigators still needed to find out the cause of the fire. But with so much of the evidence destroyed, they knew it would not be easy. In a crime laboratory, we have to be objective. It's not our job to convict somebody or exonerate anyone. It's our job to test the evidence and tell the truth. In this case, we looked at it. We looked at it as closely as we could, and we still could not determine that there was any ignitable liquid in the samples. At the medical examiner's office, the victim's remains were autopsied. Though her blood showed elevated levels of carbon monoxide, indicating that she had inhaled smoke, Dr. Valerie Rao wasn't confident that it was enough to suffocate her. The poor condition of her remains made further analysis impossible. Because the investigation um, really did not lead anywhere, um, it was decided by the medical examiner to call it undetermined. Without any evidence to indicate otherwise, Becky Saunders' death remained a mystery. Investigators were left with unanswered questions. The firefighters in Hernando County would soon find themselves battling another blaze. But maybe this could provide some answers. An elderly Spring Hill, Florida resident, Becky Saunders, died trapped inside her burning house. Investigators were unable to determine the actual cause of the fire. Fire rescue, what is your emergency? Ten days later, the Hernando County dispatcher received a call. Another house was on fire, and an elderly couple was trapped inside. Firefighters entered the smoke-filled house and saw a woman collapsed on the floor. They carefully carried her to safety. A man was trapped unconscious in the back of the house. I've got a second victim. The victims, Mr. and Mrs. Ted Burton, were an elderly couple in poor health. They were rushed to the hospital. Forensic supervisor Russ Knodel investigated. Someone had broken into the home, had beaten the elderly lady. Her husband in the bedroom heard the commotion, came out. He was beaten. And then they attempted to set a drape on fire and left. Investigators noticed a bystander engrossed by the rescue. Because entry was forced and the victims were beaten, detectives questioned everyone in the area, including the bystander. His name was Brian Searsley. He said he lived in the neighborhood and that he'd seen nothing suspicious. He agreed to let investigators swab his hands for the telltale signs of an accelerant. He also allowed them to take an article of clothing for further testing. The fire had gone out only moments after it had started. The arson dog was sent in, and investigators collected debris to test for accelerants. If an accelerant was used, detectives believed it might point them in the direction of a suspect. There was some alcohol poured in a dish with a candle the candle was lit and then put underneath the drapes, and the drapes caught on fire. The rest of the house remained undamaged. It was searched thoroughly, looking for anything out of the ordinary. In the bathroom, investigators noticed a cabinet door open. Not sure what it could mean, the cabinet was dusted for prints. At the state arson lab, 
Brian Searsley's clothes, as well as the swabs and samples from the Burton house, were analyzed. Traces of gasoline were found on his clothes, but there was no evidence of gasoline at the crime scene. He was eliminated as a suspect. Police studied crime scene photographs, hoping to spot something they'd missed. Mrs. Burton suffered from Alzheimer's, okay, and Mr. Burton had lapsed into a coma, so the couple was unable to aid investigators. They found no evidence that the similarities between the Burton fire and the Saunders fire was anything more than coincidence. Right off the edge of the carport. Now, we know it wasn't a robbery, because as we were going through the home, we opened up the drawer in the bedroom, and that's a picture of the drawer opened up in the bedroom. And if you'll notice, you can start to see a wallet, a man's wallet. When we picked up the wallet and opened it up, it had a lot of cash in it, so we know it wasn't a robbery. With no known motive and no possible suspects, the evidence baffled investigators. Later that day, another fire was reported in a neighboring town. Singapore radio. You have fire on the scene now. We've received a call that there was a fire up in uh, Brookridge. Again, the fire was hot and it had burnt severely to where everything in the bedroom had dropped onto the ground. We processed that scene looking for anything we could find. Like the first victim, 70-year-old Monique Jenkins had been found burned beyond recognition on her bed. And like the last fire, a bathroom cabinet stood open. Once again, most of the evidence was destroyed but investigators collected what they could from the smoldering debris. The body was burned beyond recognition. At autopsy, the medical examiner was unable to find the cause of death. The examiners did find the victim's hands were bound with duct tape, rendering her helpless. Examiners found no fingerprints on the tape. Again, there was no clear motive for the crime. The detectives approach us and they're looking for anything they can find that will forensically link something or someone to these cases. They're wanting to know if we got fingerprints. They're wanting to know if we got any trace evidence, if we found any accelerants or anything that they can put their hands on to help them in the direction they're going in this case. And at this particular time, we were not able to come up with anything. Very frustrating for the whole team. Okay, folks, we're here today to review the facts that we've come up with thus far. Detectives compared evidence gathered at the three fires, hoping to come up with something that would tie them together. We had a great amount of intense heat inside this master bedroom. It appears to be some type of a home invasion at this point when uh, well, both, both the victims were killed. The intensity of the blaze indicated an accelerant was used to cover up another crime. Once we examined the remains, we clearly showed that uh, she was had been duct taped with her hands clearly duct taped behind her back. So that's really the first indication that uh, we're dealing with something other than accidental fires. This was the crucial piece of evidence that began to link the arsons. Because now we know we had a problem. We felt now we have somebody going around breaking in homes and burning these elderly women up. Police followed through on several leads. None paid off. Worried, a man checked on his neighbor, Rita Talbot, after he hadn't seen her for a few days. Her front porch was littered with unread newspapers. She didn't answer the door. With the key she had given him, the neighbor entered the house. found her in the bedroom, dead. 
Once again, police were called. They were all too familiar with this neighborhood. In fact, Rita Talbot lived on the same block as Becky Saunders, the first fire victim. Scott? Hey, Russ. What do we got going? Looks like another one. Um, I haven't been in the scene yet, but we have, uh, we're doing some process now on the side of the house. We've got an open window, looks like it could be our point of entry. And, uh, but this crime scene was different. The house did not catch fire. Detective Mike Owens noticed the stains around the bed. What we've got is, looks like a pour pattern, Scott. Looks like uh, we've got some alcohol bottles up there on the bed. And what they may have done, or might have been done here, is alcohol poured in the carpet. And not enough with this carpet to substantiate a burn, but it melted all the carpet down. Look at this pattern. Look at the bed. How about the bed? Did the bed get anything? Looking at the bed. So if you look over here, we don't have... The crime scene technicians dusted for fingerprints. This time, they found one. The print was lifted and sent to the lab for analysis. They collected samples of the carpet, hoping the fibers would yield clues. Cigarette butts and some empty alcohol bottles were recovered. After weeks of frustration, this tragic crime scene produced several key clues. Now, detectives hoped the forensic evidence would bring them closer to capturing the killer. For almost two months, detectives had been tracking a killer who was wreaking havoc on a peaceful Florida neighborhood. At the most recent crime scene, police found several clues, including a fingerprint they hoped would lead them to a suspect. Detective Scott Beerweiler believed the recovery of this evidence was crucial. The past houses of the victims, of the deceased, um, had been burned. A lot of the evidence had been destroyed. We were not real successful in obtaining evidence. So we were all encouraged going into this house, knowing that it was most likely going to be tied with the other victims, same suspect in this. And if we were going to obtain any type of evidence, our best shot was to get it out of this particular house. Fingerprints were also lifted from a vehicle parked in the latest victim's garage. At autopsy, it was revealed there were marks left by the duct tape used to tie her hands behind her back. She had been strangled. All but two of her ribs were broken and her neck was snapped. They also determined she was sexually assaulted. Inside her throat, the medical examiner found a single hair. As detectives gathered their evidence, news of the murder spread. Detective Tom Holly received an anonymous tip. I was finishing up my paperwork. I was working late last night, and I got this anonymous phone call from a female who tried to disguise her voice and kind of only whispered. But she, she said she knew who the, the killer was from Spring Hill. And she gave me the name of Edwin Caprat. So we should have some good quality prints to compare with those of that. What is his name? Caprat, you said? Caprat. It's going to hinge on forensics at this point. Forensic specialist Gary Kimball compared the prints recovered at the crime scene with those on file. Detectives learned Caprat had a long history of arrests. Well, um, he does have a criminal history. He's a convicted felon out of Hillsborough County. And 91, we have a homicide, willful kill, first degree, robbery, and forgery from Tampa PD. And they also learned Caprat performed odd jobs for several of the victims. One detective remembered interviewing him at the first crime scene. Kimball believed he was onto something. Forensic supervisor Russ Canodal examined the findings, looking for certain characteristics, such as identical loops and patterns. They were eager to share the news. But since Caprat was a local handyman and worked for several of the victims, his prints could be easily explained. 
in the garage. They needed more. That's great. Scratch, too. For two weeks, the Pratt was placed under 24-hour surveillance. Their goal was to collect more physical evidence. After he left a local bar, detectives took one of Caprat's cigarette butts, hoping to match his DNA to the saliva on the cigarettes recovered at the crime scene and to the hair found lodged in the victim's throat. The DNA matched. It was the connection they needed. Detectives obtained an arrest warrant and went to the suspect's most recent residence. Michael Caprat was placed under arrest for the most recent arson murder of Rita Talbot. In a room lined with photos of the crime scenes and the many files police had collected, detectives questioned Caprat. Prior to even interviewing, we knew that he was our guy, so we, we pushed forward with it. And Detective Douglas and myself kind of took on the, the good guy, bad guy detective. At first, he denied everything. But when confronted with the evidence, he confessed. Once we started our interview, he basically, we couldn't shut him up, basically. He just talked on and on and on and on. During the three-hour interview, he confessed to murders of three women as well as the four arsons. Caprat was charged with three counts of murder, two counts of attempted murder, and three counts of rape. The forensics evidence clinches the case for us, but there's nothing like a confession. According to his confession, Michael Caprat chose elderly victims because he believed they were vulnerable. He broke into their homes and crept into their rooms. He would restrain his victims with duct tape, then proceed to rape and beat them. He poured rubbing alcohol that he took from their own bathrooms, spilling it on and around their beds. He then lit a match. For his crimes, Michael Caprat was sentenced to death. On April 19, 1995, he was killed by another death row inmate. Fire can be used as a powerful weapon. Killers who choose it know little is left in its wake. Though some hope it will successfully hide their crimes, many perpetrators discover forensic evidence can survive long after the fire is out. And their trial by fire leads directly to justice. <laughs> <laughs>